not someone who attracted much national attention. He was not the darling of the media or a favorite of the Washington press corps. He never sought the limelight. Outside his home state, his name was not well known. But this plain-speaking Westerner, United States Senator Lee Metcalf of Montana, left a lasting mark on American life. Born January 28, 1911, in Stevensville, Montana, the son of Harold and Rhoda Metcalf, it was apparent from an early age that Lee Metcalf was special. He graduated from Stevensville High School as class valedictorian in 1928. He moved on to the University of Montana, then enrolled at Stanford University, where he would graduate with a degree in history. In 1934, Lee returned home and entered the University of Montana Law School. Not long after, a friend introduced Lee to a young woman from Wallace, Idaho, who had just graduated from the University of Montana with a degree in journalism. Her name was Donna Hoover, and it wasn't long before Lee and Donna were keeping company. In 1936, when he was 25, Lee Metcalf stood for election to the Montana legislature. He won by 27 votes. It was the first of many close elections. When the legislative session ended, Lee accepted an appointment as Assistant Attorney General for the state of Montana. With his new job and salary, and in the fashion of the time, Lee formally asked Donna Hoover's father for her hand in marriage. They were married on August 21st, 1938. When World War II broke out, Lee enlisted in the Army. He landed with the Normandy Invasion Force, then fought in the Battle of France, the Battle of the Bulge, and the crossing into Germany. He served in five military campaigns altogether. When Lee returned home, he wasted no time jumping into an election campaign. And at the age of 35, he was elected Associate Justice of the Montana Supreme Court. In 1952, Lee Metcalf won another close race. This time, he was elected to Congress. We should increase the minimum wage. From the we want a tax break for working mothers. We want Up to now, there's been very little relief for anyone outside the upper income bracket. Nine Americans everywhere have every right to expect that this Congress will turn in a solid record of accomplishment on domestic affairs including social security improvement, farm price adjustment, school and highway construction, and of course, natural resource development, among other things. Having now grown to three when Lee and Donna welcomed a foster son, Jerry, into their family, the Metcalfs headed to Washington, D.C., where Lee hit the ground running. They called it the Timber Exchange Bill. Big lumber interests wanted the federal government to swap forested public lands for private lands that had already been clear-cut of timber. Lee called it thievery and rallied enough support to stop it. It was a remarkable victory for a freshman congressman, but Lee Metcalf was setting the stage for a remarkable career. Good evening. This is Lee Metcalf. Lee joined a group of young liberals in the House. Together, they created the Democratic Study Group to help get progressive legislation past conservative roadblocks. Lee was the junior member of a very powerful Montana threesome in Washington. It is a pleasure to be here this morning with my colleagues from Montana to discuss some important problems affecting our state. As you probably know, we have been conferring together here frequently it was Oregon's Wayne Morris who first began referring to Metcalf as Mr. Education. The name stuck. Lee's cause was federal aid to education, and year after year in the House, he took up the fight against great odds and entrenched opposition. Lee's reputation for integrity and hard work was growing. He had become a skilled legislator, a powerful influence in the House of Representatives, is how the New York Times referred to Lee near the end of his fourth term. 
1959, Lee decided to run for the Senate. This election will be very close, Lee told everyone. And once again, it was. And America's future is bright with promise for a realization of the American dream of equality of opportunity, for the conquest of poverty, of hunger and disease, and the successful attainment of the pursuit of happiness. One of the first to welcome Lee to the Senate was Hubert Humphrey. Over the next years, Metcalf and Humphrey formed a close friendship and a nearly unbeatable political partnership. Their greatest triumph was the Civil Rights Bill. As Senate liberals led by Hubert Humphrey readied the bill for what would be a very close vote on the floor of the Senate, a group of intransigent senators planned a series of parliamentary maneuvers to kill the Civil Rights Bill. But months earlier, Mike Mansfield had asked Lee to serve as Senate pro tem, and that meant Lee would chair the floor debate over the Civil Rights Bill. Just as expected, the conservatives threw up parliamentary roadblock after roadblock, but Lee, from his position in the chair, judiciously steered the debate around every attempt at delay. The bill became law. Metcalf has stripped us of any parliamentary strategy, said one frustrated opposition senator. That man is the Civil Rights Bill's secret weapon. My idea of free enterprise goes beyond the idea of fighting off red tape and bureaucracy. To make free enterprise work, sometimes we also have to compete against entrenched economic interests. What kind of a man is Montana Senator Lee Metcalf? He's Lee Metcalf said he came to the Senate to write and pass legislation that would improve the lives of common people federal aid for disabled veterans, the Cold War GI Bill, federal assistance for Native Americans, a fistful of anti-poverty legislation, the Job Corps Bill, all had Lee Metcalf's stamp on them. Lee drafted the original food stamps legislation, and he wrote the Family Farm Act. Our elderly citizens needlessly suffer from inadequate and unaffordable medical care, Lee said. Medicare is a Lee Metcalf bill. Lee was an enthusiastic supporter of women's rights. He helped draft the language for the Equal Rights Amendment and on the question of abortion, he was an early champion of a woman's right to choose. At home, Lee forged a political coalition that would serve him his entire career. The core of his support would come from organized labor, small farmers, liberals, conservationists, and veterans. Public officials have a responsibility to assure that any entity, public or private, which has sole control over a necessity of life does not take advantage of that privileged position. Lee firmly believed the cause of organized labor was a just one. Every time I meet the issues on a logical, reasonable, and rational basis, Lee said, I find myself voting with the working man. Substantial gains for the working man is part of the record of this session. One of Lee Metcalf's lasting achievements is the enactment of the National Minimum Wage Act. Lee Metcalf was an imposing figure over six feet tall, a schoolboy football star. His personal style was direct and to the point. As I hear your statement and understand it, you are committed to a policy of closing all veterans' hospitals in remote and isolated areas, whether they're small or large, and going to have a policy so that the veterans are going to have to go to medical centers. Lee's intelligence was greatly admired by his peers. Mike Mansfield referred to Lee as the finest judicial mind in the Senate. He was a brilliant parliamentarian. The Nation magazine said of Metcalf, there is no more skillful legislator working behind the scenes. He earned the respect of those who worked beside him. Howard Metzenbaum referred to Lee as a giant among his peers. His greatest strength was his honesty. He had integrity. Lee had a dry wit and a deliberate sense of timing. It was President Eisenhower who said that the future lies ahead. 
<laughs> Indeed it does. He could often be found answering his own mail on a battered old manual typewriter. And he worked at a desk that was impossibly cluttered. Lee claimed that his own filing system prevented anything really important from getting lost. A lifelong horticulturist, Lee loved to grow flowers. Then there was Donna. Lee valued her opinion highly, consulting with her regularly about his political and legislative ideas. She was a tireless campaigner, wife, friend, alter ego. Donna and Lee stood side by side for nearly 40 years. From the nation's capital, Senator Lee Metcalf and his Washington report to the people of Montana. The war on poverty has one simple objective, to get poor people out of poverty and into a decent, self-respecting, productive role in our society. The I believe we must have nationwide standards for unemployment compensation. I know much of our land is in critical condition. I think that it is high time for the government to take a hard look at the way it helps finance essential electric service. And it is not easy for a consumer to learn how Lee to Lee was one of the first to advocate the idea that consumers have rights. I'm delighted to have as my guest today one of the most interesting men in Washington, Mr. Ralph Nader. With Michigan's Phil Hart, Lee wrote and introduced the Truth in Packaging Law. And with Illinois' Paul Douglas, he wrote the Truth in Lending Law. Then Lee sponsored the Consumer Education Act, and he authored the first federal sunshine law, the Federal Advisory Committee Act. I don't think we ought to stand around, twisting our handkerchiefs, and say everything is all right when it isn't. With his friend and aide, Vic Reinemer, Lee wrote a book exposing price gouging and took out after the privately owned utility companies. It's time to illuminate the bottom side of the table, where the utility officials hand each other bundles of cut-rate stock. It was quite a fight. During my 20 years in Congress, I've originated many and supported every program for federal funds to assist hard-pressed local schools. For 20 years, Lee Metcalf was at the center of the legislative struggle to provide federal aid to education. He helped write the National Defense Education Act, and then the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. For the first time in our history, federal financing was made available for state and local schools. The New York Times called Lee the man who ensured federal aid to schools. Today, the Clean Air Act water pollution control, and recreation resources have passed as a result of public awareness. Morris Udall said, Lee Metcalf is, was, and always will be Mr. Wilderness. Many regard him as the most important voice ever heard in the United States Senate on conservation and environmental issues. The most important voice ever. He is responsible for the first pesticide control legislation to protect fish and wildlife. He introduced the Save Our Streams bill. He helped write the Air Pollution Control Act and the Clean Air Act. He sponsored the Clean Water Act and the Water Pollution Control Act. He wrote the Strip Mining Reclamation Act. He is responsible for a multitude of timberland reforms. Lee Metcalf's crowning achievement was the Wilderness Act. And he followed that with the Alaska Lands Act and the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. It is an unparalleled achievement. He spent his energy unsparingly. Lee Metcalf did not conserve himself. By the early 1970s, his health began to falter. He was reluctant to stand for re-election in 1972. But the pressure mounted, and in time, Lee agreed to run again. It would be his final election. Lee suffered a round of health problems throughout 1977. Frustrated, Lee told a reporter, I want to go home. For 30 years, I've been running for public office. 30 years is long enough. I want to go home and live in Montana. 
Lee never got his wish. Two days after Lee's death, death also came to his old friend Hubert Humphrey. Lee cared little for personal headlines. He was more likely to give credit than take credit. He never sought the public limelight. In fact, he seemed determined to avoid it. Lee was fond of saying that he regarded his political career as just one man pulling an oar, trying to propel a leaky boat. But Lee Metcalf was more than that. Few today remember his name, but his achievements are lasting. After Lee's death, one newspaper editor wrote this epitaph. He was a rare breed of man. He was from the people and spoke for the people. His death leaves a void that can never be filled. But he leaves behind a legacy that should inspire us. God has a special place in heaven for this great man. And as long as America lives, Lee Metcalf has a special place in our history. Thank you very much.